Hello, and welcome to the screencast or video lecture for materialism and behaviorism. I'm going to do an overview of chapter two in our online textbook, which begins on page 10. Last week, we talked about Cartesian substance dualism, and we can remember that Descartes thought that mind and body were in two separate realms of existence. Body was in space and in time, whereas mind is immaterial, which means it doesn't have a body. No atoms, no mass, no weight, no length, width, height. And of course, there were a whole body of theories that arose in opposition to this. Now, Descartes was influenced by the rising scientific revolution as much as almost any other philosopher that was writing at the time. But he still thought that mind couldn't be purely mechanical. When we see a factory working or when we see the structure of some kind of material, whether it's a rock or an element, that all can be explained by material theory and material forces. But mind really doesn't seem like it's amenable to that kind of explanation. It doesn't really feel like clockwork and gears of the physical world, no matter how sophisticated, could explain what it's like to think, to introspect, to feel feelings and have drives and emotions. From our textbook, it says, materialism, on the other hand, denies the existence of mind as a separate entity from the body. Now, materialism might seem immediately appealing to us in contemporary culture because we have the, the hindsight of hundreds of years of scientific explanation, and it's grounded into the heart of our culture that that's how we get to knowledge. We observe the outside world, we look at things empirically, and then we make judgments about it, and that's how we get to knowledge. Yet, even if you want to be a materialist, and in your heart of hearts you think that it's absolutely correct that mind is somehow part of the body, it's in space, it's in time, we still need to explain the difference that's apparent between understanding the physical neurons and the mapping of the brain and the what it's like to experience the world internally, subjectively. So Heather Salazar is the author of chapter two. And to try and illustrate what material, materialism excuse me, makes us commit to, she gives us an example from the movie Big. This was from the 80s. It was a Tom Hanks movie. And he went to a fair. He wished on a fortune teller machine. I have a picture of it there down in the bottom left that he wanted to be big. He was frustrated with being a child, not having any control over his life. And boom, the machine made him wake up as an adult, Tom Hanks. And we understand this intuitively because we think that mind is somehow separate to whatever material body houses it. And we can think, oh, well, okay, now this mind of a child has been transported into the body of an adult. And he goes along with his life and he tries to get a job and having a child's mind inside of an adult's body, he shuns romantic and sexual encounters and the woman who's interested in him, in him can't understand it. He brings a sense of joy to the adult world, etc., etc. Yet, if you're a materialist, you have to say that this movie is nonsensical. Because if the mind is indeed a materialist product of the brain, when your brain changes from a child's brain into an adult's brain, you're automatically not the same exact person. Even if you don't have any new experiences, learning experiences as you grow up and grow older, a child's brain has a certain set of chemicals around it. It has a certain set of neural connections and the adult brain is different. It has different hormones. It has different 
connections, and different ways of relating to its own body because the body's size is different, the shape is different, everything is different. So even while the people might be similar, if you have a new brain and a new body and you're a materialist, you'd have to say you have an entirely different mind. Salazar mentions the beginnings of empiricism again as the scientific revolution when people were just beginning to develop the scientific methodology of experimentation and reformulating their beliefs based upon whatever data they got from their experiments. Um, Descartes was a part of this, of course, but he was still also what we might call an idealist. This is an opposed to being an empiricist. And the idea, the idea here is, okay, where do we get our knowledge from? How do we build the systematic data about the world that helps us understand more about the world itself and about ourselves? And Descartes thought that ultimately the root of all knowledge and understanding came from the mind. The way we categorize the way we rationally and logically understand things. We, of course, need data from the outside world in order to classify, in order to understand causes and effects. But at the root of it, it's the mind's operations that give us the understanding. Whereas an empiricist thinks the opposite. We can only ever gain knowledge and understanding through the observation of the world. So the whole entire set of what we can know is based entirely upon what we can observe with our senses. So this is going to foreshadow an important distinction here and for the rest of the semester, but especially in the Putnam that we read as the third piece of writing for this week. And that is the difference between uh, synthetic statements, facts or truth, and analytic statements, facts, or truth. So we'll take a look at the next slide to see a few ways of describing this. Okay, so we see here on the far right in language, whenever we say something, it can be, according to this theory, analytic or synthetic. An analytic statement contains its meaning in the predicate. So the prototypical example is bachelors are unmarried men. The predicate, unmarried men, is contained within the word bachelors. We don't learn any new information. We just learn a second way of saying the same thing. So analytic truths or analytic sentences are ones that revolve around the way we categorize things. We don't have to observe anything in the outside world to understand or express them. Uh, one way to say it is that the predicate is contained within the subject. Whereas probably most statements are synthetic. We need observation about the outs from the outside world to understand the meaning of the sentence. So here it says bachelors are unhappy. And now we can never know that if or if not it's true, without observing as many bachelors as we can in our experience. In sort of related terminology, we have over there the a priori and the a posteriori. The a priori is supposed to be a category of knowledge that we can know without reference to the outside world. It's just something we can discover using logic and mind and reason alone. And these are things like one plus one equals two, or the definition of a triangle is a figure with three sides whose angles add up to 180. Whereas a posteriori is knowledge that requires experience from the outside world. Usually the a priori and the analytic are lumped in with necessary truths. And something is logically necessary if there is no possible way 
for it to be different than it already is. Whereas something is contingent if it doesn't matter. It can be changed and the thing is still the same. One example that's often used for this is that you can think about yourself. Think it's necessary that you have the DNA that you do to be you, but it's contingent that you have a particular hair color. If you dye your hair, you're still you. So your hair color is contingent to your selfhood or your identity, whereas the particular DNA that you were born with is necessary for a person to count as you. Don't worry if this is a little bit confusing at first. We will be going over it again and again. Salazar tells us that there are two things that are important to empiricists, people who think that all knowledge comes from observation in the outside world. They are the closure principle and Occam's razor. And the closure principle says that <clears throat> for any phenomenon that we observe in the entire universe, past, present, future, farthest reaches of the universe, or right here at home, we will be able to find the causes of the thing and observe its effects in the material world. So that means no immaterial mind, no causes and effects outside of time and space. And that, of course, might eliminate something like an immaterial god, but especially an immaterial soul or mind. But, of course, minds are private, and this is a concept that I really want you to internalize. Okay, so we might know or assume that the people around us have minds just like we do, but we'll never be able to enter into their stream of thought. We'll never be able to feel their feelings or recall their memories or know what it's like to be them. Therefore, on a purely material view, materialistic view, at first glance, we'll never be able to study mind because it's not observable. We can't use our senses to see what someone's mind is like. I, Ryle calls it a cult. And like it says here, the logical positivists call it not verifiable. Another principle that's important for materialist empiricists is Occam's razor. And you might have heard of this before. Uh, other people call it the principle of simplicity or parsimony. The idea is that if you observe something in a scientific experiment, you can come up with many different theories to fit the facts. You might posit that there are little green elves that steal your socks from the dryer, and that's why you lose so many socks. And the thing is, is that's possible but it posits an extra entity, those little green elves, that don't really need to be posited to solve the problem of why you lose so many socks. There are many, many other simpler explanations that are likely. Moving all your laundry, you're not, you might not notice if a sock falls out, you might not notice if it stays in the dryer, etc., etc. So Occam's razor as it applied to scientific theory is that when we're faced with competing ideas to explain some set of data, the one that posits the, the least number of new entities is the most likely to be accurate. Well, you might say, well, okay, it might be the most likely, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily correct. And that's true. We have here why you, you might want to apply Occam's razor in your life to decide which beliefs you should choose. Because of course something could be more complicated. Evolution turned out to be incredibly complicated. But we will find it eventually because we will empirically observe more data 
and incorporate it into our theories. But for now, we should only ever incorporate what we can observe into our theories instead of positing extra theoretical things that may or may not be true because we could postulate any number of random theoretical entities and we should wait until we have actual observation to decide. And now for the sort of the same justification for believing in the closure principle. I, if there are causes and effects outside of space and time, and there might be, we'll never be able to study them. So we'll never be able to gather knowledge about them. And therefore, we should look to find causes and effects in the world that we're given, the world of bodies, the world of space, and the world of time. Okay, so if everything that exists is indeed in the material world, then thinking in mind must also be in the material world. So now we're faced with the problem of trying to explain experience in materialistic empirical terms. So this means we need a solid theoretical foundation of explaining things like having a pain, smelling strawberries, or sitting down and thinking about a memory. One way materialists try to start explaining this is called type identity theory. So now to fully understand type identity theory, we need to understand what types and tokens are. We do a lot of classification as human beings. We classify some animals as cats, some animals as dogs, some plants as trees. We classify some actions as moral and others as immoral. And that's a type, okay? So a type of animal is a cat or a type of biological creature is an animal. A token is a specific instance of a type. So if the type is cat, your cat muffin is a token of that type. So for identity theorists, type is much stronger than token. So they say that your mental state is identical to whatever state your body is in. So say you have a mental state of pain that is identical to whatever that means in your body. Maybe you have some damage on your arm and the nerves are firing and that sends messages in your brain and the certain pattern of neurons that are firing, all the things that are happening in your entire body is identical with what pain is. And I have to stress here, that doesn't mean that there are two different types of things that are always correlated together, the feeling of pain and your body state. For type identity theorists, they are one in the same thing. There's no such thing as pain describable from the inside. We're only feeling the body state from a perspective. And there's an, a very extreme version of this in which some eliminative materialists say there's no such thing as mind. Mind is an illusion that we persist in because it's the way we experience body states. It's nothing over and above the body state itself. But if you were an eliminative materialist or a strong type theorist, you'd have to say that other kinds of animals couldn't feel pain because they don't have the same brains and bodies that we do as human beings. And this goes against what a lot of people believe, either intuitively or scientifically. It does seem like other mammals have nervous systems that would likely contribute to them feeling something similar to us when it comes to pain. So the strong version doesn't seem to hold much water. There is a weaker version called the token identity theory, which Salazar, the author of this chapter, mentions, but says we'll talk about it a lot more later when we talk about functionalism. And that's true, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Since we already do recognize that many animals 
seem to be feeling something similar to us when they are feeling pain or avoiding some sort of stimulus that might cause harm to their body, we can say that there is a token identity. So if a cat is feeling pain or if you're feeling pain, the body state that you're in is identical to that feeling of pain. So instead of the whole entire class of pain being the same in every single human, instead, in a particular token individual, the body state they're in is identical with pain in a token sense. Another kind of materialism is behaviorism. And I might say behavioralism. I'm not sure why I can't say it straightforwardly every time, but I always mean behaviorism. You might have heard of two very famous behaviorists in other fields, not philosophy, B.F. Skinner and Ivan Pavlov. So we hear about the Pavlovian response, and we know it has something to do with a dog salivating at a bell, and that is indeed what he did. He wanted to show that uh, you could be taught, you could be conditioned to associate certain things happening in the environment with an expectation. So every time he gave the dog treats, he would ring a bell, and then later on after he did that dozens and dozens and dozens of times, when he rung the bell, the dogs started salivating in anticipation of the treats, even if they never came. And that's called classical conditioning because it's modifying a previously existing behavior. Whereas what Skinner did is called operant condition, conditioning because it's teaching them entirely new behavior. And he's known for the Skinner box. And one of the main ways he did it was with rats or mice where they'd be in the box and there'd be a bar that they could push. And if they pushed the bar, some of the mice got treats or food and some of them didn't. And eventually the ones that did get food were trained to push the bar more and more and more to get food. So this is an entirely new behavior. You condition someone to behave in a certain way. Now, philosophical behaviorism has some things in common with scientific behaviorism. And especially, it's that whatever goes on inside of the organism is like a, a plain black box. Uh, we can't get to it. We can only see inputs and outputs. If we can't empirically observe the mind, we can empirically observe behavior. So that's how we have to make our decisions about everything if we're true empiricists, if we're true materialists. The minds are private, remember. So all we can do to judge about minds is to observe human behavior. The logical positivists, uh, that's a name given to a group of philosophers starting at the very early 20th century all the way up through the mid 20th century. So around 1900, or late, late 1800s to the 1950s. And they were taking these trends in science and in empiricism and trying to apply them to philosophy. And they thought that a lot of philosophy as it had been done for thousands of years was unverifiable. Meaning that even in theory, if we had the best technology in the universe that we could possibly think of, we could never get to observe it because it's just not possible. And that's mind. We can't even think of a way in which we could open up someone's brain and observe how they feel or what they're thinking. And so verificationism was a movement to change philosophy's goals and methods to something that could be verified. We have to focus only on behavior to understand mind. Now, of course, for human beings, we have language, and that means we can self-report on what we're thinking and feeling. And language is a behavior. It is an action. So we can use language to at least tangentially understand 
what we mean when we talk about mind concepts like pain or dreams or desires. We have to stick with speech alone because even if someone's self-reporting and saying, I am in pain, we still don't have access to their experience. So we can only listen to the words that they use. Here on the right are some of the Vienna Circle, the logical positivists. Uh, Bertrand Russell was in there for a while and a lot of them actually moved away from logical positivism as the years went on. Because as we'll see, there are some serious problems with logical positivism. Now, a species or a type of logical positivism is logical behaviorism. So if I tell you that I'm in pain, that's part of my set of actions, but it can't be thought of as completely reliable because again, we don't have access to the private mind. Instead, pain is a concept that consists in the entire set of behaviors that people do when they're in pain. So wince or cry or avoid the stimuli that cause the pain. And it doesn't even have to be just pain. Every single internal experience that you have for logical behaviorists can only be defined by the set of behaviors that are associated with that concept. Now, of course, there are serious problems that most people have. First, what about all the things that we think and do and feel and say that never make it to behavior. If you sit and introspect, is my life going the way I want it to or the way I thought it would? Uh, and you think about it all day, every day for a week and a half and there's no external behavior. Does that mean that what's going on in your head is nothing? People really genuinely don't wanna say that that's the case. On the other prong of what logical positivists or behaviorists do, the verificationism. Well, how do we verify verificationism itself? There's a, a paradox, a logical paradox. Uh, how can you prove or disprove whether verificationism is the only way to get knowledge? Well, you'd have to do it using verification. And that's a circle, and therefore, the entire concept is logically defeated. So, okay, we still might want to be materialists, but we haven't done it yet. Both the type identity theorists and the logical behaviorists have serious problems to contend with, so we have to look for new types of theory. We still have this problem of not being able to observe minds and mental experience, but most people don't want to give up the fact that it's really something that happens. Mind is real and experience is real. When we say something is reducible or irreducible in philosophy, we mean that the more complicated thing can be fully explained by its more fundamental parts. So if we're reduce, uh, reductionists about mind, we would argue that physics and behavior and biology can completely explain mind. But if you are someone who doesn't think that that's possible, you think that there's something about mind wherein it might be completely material that maybe it's the way it's organized. That's a little hint for where some of our future theories then there's something special about the new entity, even though no, no materialist would say brains aren't made up of atoms and they aren't made up of subatomic particles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, something about minds isn't explainable, if even if we were the best physicists possible. So so far are two theories that we've looked at haven't been able to reduce mind to brain as a goal of materialism might be. And in future weeks, we will look at alternatives. But for now, our next two articles are gonna go into quite a bit more detail about first behaviorism, and then second, our third and final article, 
a counter argument against behaviorism. So there'll be three articles this week. And as always, please contact me if you have any questions, comments, or confusions.